Ethno-archaeological field project, which combines methods of, of ethnography with um, the sort of motivations and research models of archaeology. So broadly, we're using the study of the present to understand the past. And the way we do that is through this concept of ethnographic analogy, which has to be applied very carefully, right? Because the present, which has been informed by all of the history, all of the cultural interactions leading up to the present, it's not the same as the past, even if we might have some continuing traditions. Um, but the hope is that we can use some of these traditions, some of these life ways, to understand what may have been happening in the past. So we design archaeologically motivated research. We are looking at behaviors and their material manifestations in the present um, with the intention of applying that data to, uh, to data that is recoverable and observable archaeologically. Um, it's often been used to look at site formation processes, um, deposition of artifacts in um, certain contexts. Um, it's been used to look at ceramic production, uh, ceramic distribution, um, this notion of household assemblages. What is a household assemblage and what's in it? And it has been applied to the study of pastoral nomads um, quite successfully, mostly to look at mobility patterns to do predictive modeling of where we expect um, these sites to appear on the landscape. Um, and then to study those sites spatially to um, predict and then excavate archaeological sites based off of how um, nomadic pastoralists use the landscape today. Um, Ethnoarchaeology uh, ethno as applied to material culture um, hasn't been used so much with the study of organics, though there are some examples. Um, it's been used um, especially to look at ceramic production. Um, it's used to <coughs> recover information on traditional manufacturing techniques to help us understand technologies in the past, uh, to look at cultural transmission, knowledge transfer, um, ideas of apprenticeship, how do we share knowledge and how is that knowledge changed as it's transmitted down generations. Um, it's used to examine organization of production, um, to ask questions of emerging craft specialization, um, and then to look at object functions, object categories that we may not um, have in our own cultures, but some, uh, there might be some uh, useful information about how people categorize the material culture that they're using in the present. Okay, <clears throat> so why look at height and fiber crafts? And what are they? Um, hide and fiber crafts are anything made from animal skins, animal furs, animal fibers, hair, wool. Um, and they survive extremely well in Mongolia. That's not true in most places. Um, usually archaeologists find ceramics, stone, uh, bone, things that survive much more easily. Um, almost always textiles and leather are destroyed archaeologically. But when you have a very cold and dry climate like Mongolia, in certain contexts, you actually get really excellent preservation. So Mongolia has this abundant uh, archaeological record of hide and fiber objects um, that uh, are in need of study, in need of understanding and exploration. And this is um, an ethno-archaeological project as a part of beginning to um, make some models of how to understand this archaeological record. Um, and luckily, a lot of traditional methods of producing hide and fiber crafts are still practiced in Mongolia. Um, and what I did is I went into the countryside and, and interviewed people and observed um, the production of these objects and um, talked to people about how they use and understand those objects that were made in the past. So this is just an example of some of those organic objects that are so beautifully preserved in Mongolia. This material is over a thousand years old. Um, from Holt IMAG, and this is the subject of uh, my uh, undergraduate thesis. Um, this is what inspired me to do this project, is trying to understand this material. There's only so much that you can infer or hypothesize when you're not familiar with a tradition, you're not familiar with um, the culture that, um, that produces the certain values and the economic and ecological factors 
that go into creating an assemblage like this. So my research objectives, um, I wanted uh, at the most basic level to describe some production sequences for, for similar objects. How do people make these things? Where do they get the raw materials? How do they process the raw materials? Um, and then I wanted to talk to the people who are actively uh, both producing and using these objects to record object histories, um, the stories um, embodied in these objects, um, how people are using them, how people are reusing them, um, and eventually how people are discarding them. Um, and then I wanted to look at use wear patterns. Use wear is uh, the wear and tear that appears on an object because it's being used in a certain way. Um, I wanted to see if it's possible to actually relate that use wear to specific activities. Um, and then I wanted to look at possible relationships between household specialization and certain types of lifeway, certain um, uh, relationships to mobility or sedentarization. This is very sort of preliminary um, question uh, being asked here, but um, I did get some data that might direct future research on this topic. Okay, so I went to many, many places. <laughs> um, it was sort of a whirlwind trip divided into two parts. So the first part was in central Mongolia, going down south into the Gobi. Um, the goal was to examine different textile tradition, or not just textiles, um, organic crafts in different ecological regions where different animals are utilized and um, we're dealing with different, slightly different environmental conditions. Um, and then the second trip was to Bayanolgi to be in a, a mountainous environment where there's also um, a different Kazakh-based tradition of crafts. I don't get too much into that in this presentation, but I did look at embroidery and felt making. Uh, and then I, I, did, it, I conducted interviews in the countryside with um, nomadic families, um, but also in the Som centers and the IMAC capitals to begin to understand some of that uh, differentiation and relationship to craft based on where people are living. Okay, so what is a production sequence? This is an important concept in material culture studies. It's also called the chaîne opératoire for the anthropologists and French speakers out there. Um, craft traditions are based on an understanding of these production sequence, sequences, um, defining each step in the production sequence and looking for patterns. Um, basically, a production sequence begins with the procurement and processing of raw materials. Um, there are many steps depending on what specific type of object we're talking about, um, but those materials are processed into some sort of object, um, and then the object is used for some period of time, and it might be repaired as part of that use, and the repair is part of that production sequence, and then eventually it's discarded, and that discard has, um, that discard is significant as well. Okay. So for an example, um, spinning is one part of the production sequence, in this case of quilted felts. Um, and I observed several women spinning, and there were some um, commonalities that can help to identify a textile tradition. Um, people were spinning almost exclusively with uh, camel male wool, which is the wool from the kind of beard of the camel, mainly. That's rougher, it has more guard hairs, it's longer, uh, it's really easy to spin. Usually longer uh, fibers are much easier to spin. Um, people did also spin sheep's wool. Um, people were always spinning clockwise. Um, textile archeologists know this is Z spinning. Um, this is also this uh, method of spinning that predominates um, in the 10th century textiles I've examined. Um, both Kazakh women and Mongolian women were spinning with this technique. Uh, and when I asked why, um, most people just said, well, it's how my mother spun, it's how my grandmother spun. That fits with our models of, of apprenticeship within the family. Um, some people did relate it to um, different aspects of Mongolian culture of entering a gear and going around clockwise, for example. Um, and then in, the, the, in this picture, so first she's spinning the wool with a spindle. In this picture, she actually has a there's a, like a candy tin being used as a weight. And the threads are being held underneath the candy tin and wrapped around a nail that's stuck into this carpet. So she's actually spinning quite short lengths of yarn rather than one long length of yarn. And then she's wrapping them 
around this nail and plying them into extremely short, about this long, lengths of yarn. Um, and then we can see in this object, um, this was a great piece. It was a, uh, described as a final exam piece by a woman who had taken a class in felt making. And it's a little tricky to see in the picture, but there are all these little knots that when examining this piece, you can tell it's made with these short lengths of yarn rather than one long length of yarn. So that's something that should be identifiable archaeologically if people are using the same technique. Um, I looked a lot at um, processing of hides and sheepskins. Um, people almost universally use shoe. If someone knows what this is chemically um, or has an English name for it, I think it's natron or something similar. Um, it's, it's a sort of powdery substance that's used to cure um, raw leathers to begin the tanning process. Whoops. Uh, is this? Okay. And then, oh, sorry. So I saw several times people processing um, hides using a wooden tool. So archaeologically, we can find not only um, the final products, but we can sometimes find tools um, that were used to process um, hides and, and produce textiles. And then there are two different types of stitching that were common. So this very fine, I don't know if you can see it, it's white stitching, um, is used to join the pieces of leather together. It takes eight to 10 sheepskins to produce one dell. And then this very loose stitching is used to attach the fabric cover, which is replaceable. So this is actually something I've seen archeologically, um, where people are producing these finely stitched together um, sheepskin garments, and then they're loosely stitching on a fabric cover, which can be replaced. So this question of use wear. I was inspired to ask this question by various bio biological anthropologists that I know who use markers of occupational stress to understand or attempt to infer activities that people were engaged in in the past. Things like archery, things like horseback riding, grinding grain. Um, so my question was, can we, can we do this with textiles? Can we do this with the clothes that people are wearing, potentially? So for an example, um, we can look at non-occupation specific use wear. And this, it was possible to relate to how long a garment had been worn. So especially the fabric garments are actually being replaced every year, every other year. Um, I think we often tend to think of, oh, well, people hold on to things for so, so long in the past. They do repair them multiple times, but these garments just don't last that long. The sheepskin garments do, um, but they do have to be repaired. Um, so I actually found it was much more helpful to look at the sheepskin garments to look at use wear because once, uh, once the fabric garments had gotten significantly worn down, they weren't repaired, they were simply discarded. In the past, people were repairing more. Now it's much cheaper to purchase fabric. We're not weaving the fabric. <laughs> so it's a little bit different, the situation. Um, but looking at the sheepskin garments, I was able to trace some of these use wear patterns, um, both non-specific wear, mostly on the sleeves, on the bottom hem of the garment. That's just like when you skin your knee and you break a hole in your jeans. Um, I'm pretty sure this is a picture of fancy pre-distressed jeans. So it was difficult to find the real deal, but um, if you've ever ripped a hole in your jeans, you know what this is like. Eventually, you wear your jeans long enough, you are gonna get a hole in the knee, and it's not necessarily associated with a specific activity. If you've ever ripped your pants getting on a horse, that's something that's maybe a little bit more specific to a certain activity. And I was actually extremely surprised at how consistent the answers were that I was getting when I asked people, well, how did, how did you wear the hair off of this garment? Where did this rip come from? Why did you patch it here? Over and over again, I got the same answers. I think the most consistent and most easily applied to the archeological record is these examples of wear associated with horse riding. The hair is just worn off the back, just on the seat of the, of the dell. It's, now it seems very common sense, um, but I'll show you a picture at the end. I was looking at this archeological um, fur and sheepskin dell for a month, and it never occurred to me that this was from horse riding. Um, but I think that's what we're seeing. 
um, the sleeves being ripped off. Um, the sleeves are kind of the first thing to go. So it's more non-specific kind of wear, um, and they're often totally replaced. That's also something I've seen archaeologically. Um, this rip right up the armpit. Um, this woman told me with absolute certainty that that was from whipping a camel. <laughs> she would put her arm back to, to whip the camel. Um, and she's not the only person who told me that. Uh, I don't know how confident I am at trying to identify that archaeologically, but it was interesting how consistent the answers were. Um, other things that were really consistent, dairying, you get all sorts of milk um, products in the front and on the, um, like on the knees. Um, there was one woman who told me that wear on the side, right here, was associated with having many children because she would hold her child inside of her dell and use it to rub their back. So there are all sorts of interesting potentials looking at gender, gender division of labor associated with use wear on textiles. So here's one sort of close-up example. This was also really helpful because when you're looking at an archaeological object that is sort of all around messy and you're not quite sure, is this original, is this a patch, is this a repair, is this replaced, actually looking at some of these objects helped identify some patterns that can be useful in answering those questions. So what I did notice really consistently was that the original stitching tends to be really tight, really small. They're trying to um, you know, put together this nice and consistent looking object. As soon as, as soon as it has to be repaired, that sort of aesthetic dimension goes out the window. They're using these huge stitches. They're using different colors of thread. Once an object has to be repaired, it's essentially moved into a separate aesthetic category. It's often not used for going out. It's used for work. So we have different categories of objects, different places where it's appropriate to wear that garment. And once it has to be repaired, it's sort of downgraded. Um, these triangle pieces, looking at these, originally I might have thought that they were patches where the object had been repaired. Um, triangles and also small circles are used to reinforce weak elements in the skin um, as it's being produced originally. So they're not patches, they're actually original. And, and you can see that the stitching is just as fine as on the original seams. So another major uh, question I was looking at is this idea of seasonality. So archaeologists are interested in, in understanding when things are happening, um, and especially as it relates to, to nomadic life ways, um, how do certain activities relate to seasonal migrations? Um, what I did find is that for craft, we have to be looking at seasonality on a much, much smaller, more refined scale, like 10 days at a time. Um, because sheep wool grows, I had no idea, oops, one centimeter in just 10 days. It's a quite noticeable difference. So people talked a lot about matching hides. You want to match the hides really well um, to produce a, a, an especially fine garment. So you have to collect hides of sheep slaughtered in a 10-day period. If you are getting hides that are slaughtered outside of that period, then you're going to have a less well-matched garment. And lots of people did have those, um, but they would sort of complain that it was not the best quality. Um, so to actually do that, most families cannot actually consume that many sheep because they're slaughtering them in the summer for their hides mainly. Um, it's the, the hair is too long in the winter for the most part, except for the, uh, the dell for the coldest weather. So it's in the summer. They have to coordinate with other families, with their neighbors, in order to actually acquire the ten, 8 to 10 skins that they need. Um, in the past, sheep were sheared twice. Now, mostly sheep are sheared once, and lamb's wool is used for m more fine purposes. Um, when you have sheep being sheared twice, um, you have to look at, you're going you're gonna to get short fibers used in the felt. So archaeologically, I do see that extremely short fibers being used in the felt to make a finer felt, which reflects this, this pattern of double shearing. Um, and we can also look at that with the sheepskins. Um, and then I saw a few examples of sheepskins that were 
from animals that were slaughtered within the month after they were first sheared. The hair is extremely, extremely short. Um, mostly people were using this as, as just like a rug outside of the door to wipe their feet um, or kind of a mat underneath something else. Um, so you can imagine if somebody is using that in a garment archaeologically, what does that say about status and access to resources? So this is, this is one uh, herder showing me the staple length of his big winter dell. This is only worn for, he said, a couple of weeks. This is for the coldest weather. This is a six inch staple. <laughs> So that's a sheep that's slaughtered in the, in the depth of winter and also used by humans at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So this question of specialization, I don't have really um, in-depth data. I would need a lot more data to begin to really answer this question, but I did see some patterns that were kind of interesting. Um, usually archaeologists associate specialization with sedentarization. Um, that's not what I saw. Um, I saw that herders, especially also ex-herders, people who are recently herders living in Solm centers, um, were engaged in semi-specialized or household specialization, um, where they were producing garments not only for their own and their family's use, but also for sale. Um, as soon as people became more urbanized, um, they felt that they had lost access to the materials and the skills that they needed. Um, they couldn't. Um, sometimes couldn't afford to own uh, one of these garments. Um, I talked to one person who was essentially in a family feud over um, her, I think it was her grandfather's sheepskin dell that she wanted for her husband, but her brother had it. <coughs> so the, this, the competition for these resources becomes stiff. The value um, increases when you are separated from um, this sort of direct access to the raw materials that you need um, to produce these objects. So it seems that if we're going to be looking at specialization of hide and fiber crafts, we shouldn't be looking at urban settings. We shouldn't be looking at urbanization and sedentarization. We should be looking at ways in which speci specialization is actually occurring in a mobile environment. Um, one thing that uh, is really interesting that emerged is this idea of interconnection of individual objects. So, sorry, the pictures are not great. But this is an entire coat made from the fur of a palace cat, a manual, the whole thing. And this is uh, a child's coat that sort of goes with it, and the tails of the palace cats are used on the, co on the coat. Um, there was another coat that was uh, made of wolf skins, and accompanying it in the same family was a vest made from just the skin of the paws and the snouts of the wolves, which is a lower quality skin. But people aren't wasting it. People aren't throwing it away. They're using it. And within one family, within one household assemblage, we're seeing that we can relate individual objects to each other, where the actual specific raw materials being used for one object are also being used in another object. Um, with the felts, probably a lot of people are familiar with how these are made. This, see this black part is cut out? That's this from this piece. This red part is cut out of this piece. Same here, and they're interchanged. So the outside parts are sort of consistent with each other. We're not, uh, there's nothing kind of left over. But the inside part, where is all the pink felt that once surrounded this shape? That's what we should be asking. So in most cases, it's in the house of a female relative. Um, whether by marriage or by blood, because people are usually making these together. Um, sometimes they're, they're given as gifts. They're called twin carpets. So the idea is that all these objects are interconnected with each other, and if we're finding parts of the objects, we should be asking, where's the rest of this object? Where's the rest of the material? Where's the rest of the skin? Um, and we might be able to see some connections. These are all related to um, close social relationships, usually family relationships or within the same household where people are using the same sort of store of raw materials or um, exchanging um, parts of objects that they also have in their own homes. Um, extreme weather is possibly something we can begin to access through material culture. This is a coat made of 
the skins of young foals. So you can see this is actually the curly mane here of these foals. So uh, this is from um, Bainolgi. And um, young foals almost never die in the winter in a normal, in a normal situation. Um, it has to be a fairly extreme weather event um, for these young horses to die. Lambs die all, all the time. Um, people showed me lambskin dells, which were the highest quality, and they were saying they could gather 20 lambskins. Um, one family could gather 20 lambskins in a season because of the casualties associated with extreme weather in the early spring. But the foals are more resilient, so these foal skin garments, they're never slaughtering the foals. They're only dying naturally. So when we're seeing, um, sometimes it's published as colt skin, for example, in Pazwick burials, what is that saying about, about the climate, about the weather that people are experiencing at the time? I'm not sure. If